Hello, everyone. My name is Hassan. I am a grad student from Texas Tech University, and I study atmospheric science. And this summer, I worked on determining planetary boundary layer depth via integrated data viewer from atmospheric sounding profile data. I apologize in advance for my presentation being a little bit longer and a little bit sciencey, but here we go. All right. First things first, I would like to thank Unidata and UCAR for giving me this incredible opportunity and one of the best summers ever since I came to the US. So thanks for that. And the entire Unidata staff for being super supportive, especially my mentors, Yuan Ho, Drew Cameron, and Shay Carter for helping me with setting up Java and brainstorming research ideas and the code reviews and everything. Uh, my fellow interns, Rowan and Nathaniel, for being super collaborative and helpful, and the wider UCAR NCAR intern program for development workshops and also for all the trips around Boulder. And I did turn down skydiving because I'm scared, so that didn't happen. But yeah, diving right into the subject of my research, which is planetary boundary layer depth. Uh, it's defined as the critical interface that trade mass, energy, and momentum between the surface and free troposphere. So the boundary layer is the volume of the air which is in direct contact with the surface. Sun comes up, heats up the surface, and this heat is transported to the rest of the atmosphere through sensible heat flux, and this sensible heat flux direct impacts are felt inside the atmospheric boundary layer. Uh, as you can see in this qualitative picture, we are concerned with the yellow shaded portion over here. So it can range from a few hundred meters to a few kilometers, particularly uh, two to three kilometers. Uh, the yellow uh, boundary layer has a diurnal pattern. During the day, uh, it's called the convective mixed layer. It has a different profile than it does at night. For purpose of simplicity, in this research project, I will be focusing mainly on convective mixed layer. That's whatever happened during the day, after 12 p.m. and before 4, uh, before 4 p.m. One of the really striking features of this boundary layer is how do we uh, see where the boundary layer happens, where the boundary layer ends. And that's what's defined by this capping inversion over here. This graph is the vertical potential temperature profile. And because atmospheric boundary layer is a direct outcome of sensible heat flux, as we go away from the surface, sensible heat flux decreases unless it becomes completely negative. And where it becomes negative, we have this capping inversion. And obviously, if you have higher temperature, you will have this capping inversion at higher uh, altitudes. That's what happens during the summer. And during the winter, it will be at lower altitude. Uh, despite the temperature, we can also have uh, the topography and other atmospheric features which uh, impact this particular height as well. So why should we care about the boundary layer? We should care because it's a super important parameter for weather forecasting and climate modeling. And unfortunately, right now, there's like a million microphysics uh, parameterization which is going on in PBL. So there's a lot of research which is going on in boundary layer at present, so it's super relevant for that. It's super important for surface air pollution consideration, especially for forecasting air quality. As you can see in these graphs, the first three profiles are actually meteorological parameters. It's virtual potential temperature, wind speed, and water vapor mixing ratio. The last one is pollutant concentration, and it follows kind of a similar trend as these meteorological profiles. So uh, if you have a high pollutant concentration on the surface, obviously you will because of the emission and a shallower PBL. So because it has a smaller volume to mix up in, it's called the ABL dilution effect. Because of that, the density of pollutants will increase very much. And that's uh, essentially what happens in Salt Lake City, because of and which results in severe pollution episodes. It happens in LA. It happens at a lot of places in China because of the topography and also shallower PBL. So it's a really interesting field of study. And the last one is urban heat island intensity, which has become increasingly relevant because of enhanced concrete uh, infrastructure that absorbs a lot of heat and results in very high PBL depths, uh, which result, which has other domino effects as well down the road, which I won't go into much depth about. For the wider users, it's super relevant for uh, the aviation industry, uh, for especially for pilots, because the shape of the planetary boundary layer is really important for airplane drag. Uh, and uh, other things. So it's the live visualization of PBL is really important for them. And for deciding the urban form, again, to reduce the UHI index for surface air pollution, uh, how the event should be laid out, how a particular urban city form should be laid out, PBL visualization is um, relevant for that. So the main aim of the project uh, was to 
for this summer was to retrieve the boundary layer information from sounding type data in IDV. Why did I choose sounding type data? Because essentially we need a vertical profile uh, to calculate uh, the boundary layer parameters and sounding type data is perfect for that. And we also uh, wanted to verify if what we are retrieving is indeed boundary layer. So we wanted to do a point by point spatial and temporal verification uh, with really uh, relevant high frequency boundary layer measurements. Uh, there are a lot of methods to determine boundary layer. The ones that I focused on were the simplest ones because I eventually realized over work by working for two weeks or something that more complex the methodology is, the more bugs it has, the more time it takes uh, to give you proper results. So the simplest thing works the best. And uh, the most renowned method to retrieve boundary layer is the temperature gradient method. Uh, that's essentially, it just basically finds out the first substantial maximum in the potential temperature gradient as you go from the surface, and that point is the boundary layer. So it's very simple. The next one is bulk Richardson number method, and this is what's used in most of the models as well. GFS uses it, WARF uses it, and the bulk Richardson number is a parameter which diagnoses flow dynamic stability. So it basically diagnoses turbulence. When you're on the surface, you have a lot of friction, a lot of heat flux, so a lot of turbulence. As you go away from the surface, the winds become geostrophic, turbulence decreases. So the last point where you have turbulence adjacent to the surface is your boundary layer. And that's what bulk register number does. This equation over here takes into account the virtual potential temperature. So the temperature, water vapor, and the horizontal and vertical wind components. Wherever this Richardson number crosses a threshold of 0 0.25 to 0 0.5, that depends upon the literature because the critical value varies. Where does turbulence end? This particular thing, the microphysics is not that clear. So that varies. So wherever that threshold is crossed, you have your boundary layer. The way that I implemented this in uh, the Python function is using uh, this particular algorithm that I think you will see on your screens in a minute because of the lag. <laughs> all right, so the algorithm uh, is pretty basic. First, you organize all the data, the sounding type data, any kind of trajectory profile in a time series data frame. So you sort it in an ascending order as you go, as you have an altitude profile. Then you find the first global maxima of potential temperature gradient with height. And after that, you find the altitude which corresponds to that maxima. Pretty simple, as you can see uh, in this uh, Python screenshot. First, you have a data frame, which is organized uh, in an ascending, uh, ascending order. Then you have the derivative of theta with respect to altitude. Most of the times to ignore the local fluctuation, uh, people have used a seven point average as they find the derivative so that you only find the global changes. So the capping inversion rather than the local turbulent inversions wherever they are happening. And uh, then uh, according to that, wherever the derivative maximum is happening, you find the value of altitude. And that particular altitude is your boundary value. Uh, this is how it looks. Uh, I, I, I uh, played around with the NASA Discover data. It, it was a, a field project which happened in Texas and California. And these are the flight profile, uh, really beautiful uh, one hertz frequency, nice data. So you can see the red line over here tells you the boundary layer information. The first figure uh, is the potential temperature vertical profile. The next one is potential temperature gradient vertical profile. And as you can see, wherever this gradient is maximized is where boundary layer happens. All right, the next one is bulk Richardson number method. The algorithm for this method was first, all the simple thing, you organize the data in a time series data frame, then you calculate all the variables. For bulk Richardson number, we also need the wind parameters because it's essentially, it uh, quantifies turbulence and you need wind for that. So it cannot be used for any data where you don't have wind parameters available. Uh, then you calculate the Richardson number and then you calculate the altitude wherever Richardson number crosses this particular threshold. So this is how that that happens. Uh, over here, this particular function is taking the value of a data frame, so any kind of data frame, and then it has a threshold, which the user will specify, whatever threshold according to their literature fixed that particular location. Uh, it calculates the uh, horizontal and vertical components of wind, then it calculates Richardson number, and then it see at the first point, wherever the Richardson number passes the threshold, is your boundary layer value. The data sets that this particular functions I tested with and that works on is the UCAR COSMIC-1 level data. COSMIC is uh, UCAR's uh, project. It stands for Constellation Observing System for Meteorology 
ionosphere and climate. It's basically a remote sensing radio occultation sounding. It's a super cool concept, really sustainable. Uh, you basically have a few satellites uh, in the lower orbit, and that takes a snapshot of a sounding. So it's uh, the, te the technology is improving, and I really believe that in the coming time, this would be one of the major things which can be used to find uh, boundary layer information. And this actually feeds most of the GFS and the WARF uh, model input data as well to find boundary layer information values. So it's a really important data set. I also use Cosmic 2 level two, level 2 data, and Cosmic 2 is pre uh, post-2018, so it's a newer version of Cosmic 1. And I use the NASA Discover AQ Texas in California P3B aircraft data. So that's also really high frequency, good field project data. And then how do you visualize this data in the integrated data viewer? Yuan was kind enough to relay all the Python code that I'd written uh, properly to Java and then implement it in the IDV. Uh, so it's super easy. You just open the IDV, select the type of sounding data you want to view in the data choosers. In the field selector, you type, uh, you choose your SKUT or whatever you want to choose, and then you click on Create Display. And uh, then you have a display, which I hope you have on your screens. So this is how you open it on IDV, and this is how it looks like. So you can see uh, over here, you have the boundary layer information, which is super important, the boundary layer height and the bulk Richardson number. Now, because the Richardson number, the critical Richardson number depends upon the user, uh, we did not assign a particular height depending on the Richardson number. Rather, you can move your cursor over the sounding and find whatever the value of Richardson number is at that particular point. Uh, next, I wanted to verify a point-by-point -point spatial and temporal correlation, and for that I needed high-frequency observation and a subset of the radio occultation cosmic data. Uh, so I chose these two data frames, uh, the NASA Discover thing, which happened in 2013, and the Cosmic One data. And for verification, unfortunately, much to my dismay, we could not do a proper spatial analysis of that because there was a lot of trouble in actually finding a proper subset of cosmic data because the UCAR archive does not allow that. Uh, but I did find one from a Jet Propulsion Laboratory. They had used it for one of the projects and used supercomputers to properly make a subset of that. But uh, we find, found out that uh, as you can see in this world map, that there is no uh, proper observations on the coast where the field projects happened. So we could not really have a proper correlation because there was no overlapping observations. All right, so yeah, this is where the observations didn't happen. And then, uh, so I wanted to verify the microphysics of retrieving PBL using these two particular methods because that is also one of the things that uh, it, it's super important and everybody's dealing with. Along the x-axis, we have PBL determination via Richardson method. Along the y-axis, we have temperature gradient method. And, and you can see there's a, quite a lot of spread uh, in the values. And this is for the NASA Discover values. Uh, the main uh, key points is that First, the change in critical Richardson number, number did not really alter any values. The red one is for RC 0 0.25. Uh, the blue one is for 0 0.5. And there's not much which is changing over here. There's like a few points going here and there. But for this specific case, it did not yield much of a change. And that can be because of the reason that this is for one particular place, Houston. Uh, so that may be one of the reasons why that didn't happen. And uh, PBL height as determined by the temperature gradient method is usually higher than the one determined by Richardson number. And that's echoed throughout the, the boundary layer literature uh, time and over that bulk Richardson number actually tends to underestimate the value. So it seems like according to the physics, both the methods are behaving the way that they should behave, but uh, still we were not able to do a proper verification because of lack of subset. So the key points from this uh, research project was the first one that integrated data, we data viewer IDV is a super useful tool for real-time retrieval of PBL. And it's super convenient to use and uh, can be used by laymen and researchers and educators alike, uh, and also for weather forecasting as well. The temperature gradient method can be used to retrieve PBL from both, both radio sound and radio uh, and RO occultation sounding from cosmic data. But the effective temporal and spatial subsetting of cosmic data is required to make it more accessible because right now it's not user accessible. If you need NC dump or a supercomputer to subset the data, it's not really accessible right now, but it can be made more accessible over time. 
for specifically for radio occultation data, the refractivity gradient and bending angle, because it's remote sensing, these two parameters can also be more explored to get the boundary layer values. So we can have more fun with the microphysics, which is being done over here. And last but not the least, we need a good uh, spatial and temporal correlation for actually verifying that the algorithms are behaving in the way that they should behave. And we ran, of ran out of time for that, but that should be the next step to be done. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Hassan. And uh, if folks have questions on presentation, please uh, raise your hand. I have, I have a question about the, uh, so uh, pronouncing right, the Richardson method. Uh, can you talk more about that selection? Uh, that, that as a computer scientist, I don't know, is, is this just uh, well documented, already in use? Is it something you discovered through uh, literature review? Uh, why, uh, why again was this selected for uh, this project? Um. So because this is used in most of the models, model okay. forecast. So the real time PBL values that we're getting from WARF or we're getting from a GFS, that is all the parameterization scheme used this particular method to calculate the values. Okay, great, thank you. And we have a question from Steve. Uh, Hassan, could you do an inter comparison between uh, the cosmic profiles and the, of the PBL and uh, uh, re regular balloon profiles using uh, this? We did, we did use the cosmic radio occultation profile, but the so basically RO uses uh, vertically stretched uh, coordinates, right? And their first value starts from the top. For the balloon soundings, their first value starts from the bottom. So the Roentzon data obviously have much better resolution when it comes to uh, the lower boundary layer values. And the occultation, our cosmic data has better resolution at the top, not at the bottom that, as that much. So uh, the verification of how good of a boundary layer value for, we can get from cosmic data compared to radio sound data data would be a really interesting thing to do. But as I said, we kind of ran out of time, but I think that would be the next thing to do, especially in the Pacific and Atlantic. And I know that there's some people who have done one paper on this. They compared uh, the values of uh, cosmic one data uh, in the Pacific Ocean with the radio sound data. And they found a lot of uh, differences between the both of them. And they used the refractivity gradient and bending angle to calculate the boundary layer values. So apparently there's a lot of difference in the way that both of them yield boundary layer values. It doesn't really correlate well, but they did not use temperature gradient and bulk Richardson number method. And that was also one of the main reasons why I wanted to uh, use these particular method. So yeah, I did not really compare uh, both of those uh, retrievals, but that would be an interesting thing to do for verification. I hope that answers yeah. your question. That would be um, that would be worth a paper. Oh, yeah, it would be. Yeah. That was actually one of the primary reasons why I wanted to explore it. I've been super into boundary layer for quite a lot of time, and I think I'm going to do this for my grad school for a PhD as well. But uh, the cosmic data set is really interesting, especially given how much um, how much of a prospect it offers. So if we can find out uh, the correct accuracy with which it yield boundary layer values, that would be a really interesting thing to explore. That has been a while. Last time I talked to people to figure out the way to use the unit data uh, technology in like a strat data server or I mean, right now subsetting the data regionally. But, uh, they never give us a good response back. <laughs> we have been proposed that for them for. Yeah, it's just. Oh, I was just going to ask that since this is IDB, can you do 3D visualizations of the We played around with that quite a lot, especially with gridded data. 
but I think you one would uh, be much you would explain it much better. But for 3D visualization with radio occultation, we would need to have some sort of interpolation because the there's a lot of gaps, especially on the surface. In the ocean, we have a lot of values, so that would be easier. So definitely, we can do that, but it's just the vertically stretched coordinates, we're not really confident with the values that we're getting. So primarily, if we're confident with the straight up values, the one dimensional values, it would be something worthwhile to look into. We actually tried it with gridded data with the GFS. We wanted to do that in the beginning. And, you know, I also played around with the WORF data and the GMS data, but it just didn't really give any meaningful obse observations out of that. And most uh, most of the boundary literature has this type of visualization. So we wanted to go with this type of visualization. Yeah, for the grid data, vertical resolution, resolution on the especially when you close to the boundary layer, we only have three, four layers of that. But the good thing about the cosmic data is they have very high. So that is why we take them. Uh, Bobby, you had a question. My question was, uh, I just wanted some clarification over the plot where you're comparing the temperature gradient method and the uh, bulk Richardson number method. Mm -hmm. um, what were each of those points supposed to represent? Was that uh, each point was a calculation at a certain time um, during the day or um, over what period of time in terms of like in, in, in the terms of the year, uh, the time of year were these uh, data, data points taken? So these are both from the uh, NASA 2013 September observations. So they were taken in Houston in September 2013 at a, on a span of 11 days. So individual 11 days. And I subset the data so that uh, it, it's only from local time 12 p.m. till local time 4 p.m. So all the boundary layer values between these particular time frame, it's basically a lot of spiral observations taken by the P3B aircraft. So it just goes up, comes down, goes up, comes down. And the individual points are the values of um, the boundary layer. And uh, so I just wanted to see that with how much of a correlation these values have, because they are supposed to tell the same parameter. But there's a quite a lot of spread, as you can see, which is happening. And so you, you, you just said um, that these measurements were taken between noon and 4 p.m. Mm -hmm. um, so why why do some of these convective mixed layers seem to be so low? Like some of these are below 500 meters, it seems. Yeah. Uh, so uh, in the Bay Area, we also have a lot of interference from the marine boundary layer. So uh, my best guess is that these are the spirals which were taken closer to the Bay. And as you go farther from the Bay, it's more representative of the proper convective mixed layer without any sort of interference or any sort of, you know, uh, intruding layer on top of that. that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you.